All right, so I'm going to um, <coughs> review uh, a keynote that I'll be giving at China Conference on Knowledge Graph and Semantic Computing in Chengdu, China. Um, I'm told they expect more than 400 or so people, and um, uh, this is where we had a paper um, that we uh, are publishing that will come out in the web intelligence uh, proceedings, and uh, I decided to use that paper as a basis of giving this talk. Um, so, machine intelligence, um, what does it mean? Uh, if you look at Google researches, uh, blogs, uh, or description, uh, they talk about it as all aspects of machine learning. But um, I'll define it a little bit differently. We'll look at, in this particular talk, we'll think of machine intelligence as something where um, machines or computer algorithms are performing something similar to or nearly or emulating uh, human intelligence. But that is expressed through human activities, human decision making and such. And in particular, there are a lot of possible things we can um, investigate in machine intelligence. So we'll focus on uh, aspects that relate to involvement of uh, data or content, of big data and content, especially how will machine understand <coughs> the data signal observations so that it can take uh, timely and good evidence-based decisions and actions, or it can help us uh, make these evidence-based uh, decision actions. Um, our view in this is um, coming from multiple perspective, or, or, or we are developing this perspective from many different perspectives. One may simply despi uh, describe that as a brain-inspired um, computing. Um, I'm interested in cognitive science, neuroscience, uh, not that I'm going to be expert in all of them, uh, certainly of course AI and machine learning and uh, cognitive computing. Um, what we want to do is to uh, take inspiration from these other fields. And um, we are not going to say that we will deeply understand exactly how the brain works at the uh, signal level, at the level of neuron transmission and all that thing. We are not interested in really understanding the biology. But at least at the level of how cognitive scientists look at the brain and how the brain works and makes decisions, and then emulating that through software, that's the kind of thing that we are interested in. Let me give you one a very interesting uh, um, data point or reference point that is, you know, unique. Uh, that's so important, and interesting about human brain, and that is fundamental to what I would call intelligent processing by our brain, or what what actually endows us with intelligence in a way, which is very critical to us having intelligence, and that is that. Our brain is able to take in, or, or our, or, or you know, senses are able to uh, accept a lot of sensory input, a lot of data that may represent the sensory input, and our brain is able to focus on something very, very um, uh, limited, something very, very important to us paying attention to that. So, some one, there is one estimate that says that. We get bombarded with about 11 million bits per second, but when we are doing some conscious activity like reading, our brain is actually that, that all that data and signals are, are, are transformed into something that is representable, a knowledge that is representable in uh, 40 bits per second. So we have amazing power. This we call this as part of perception or perception, and then computing that tries to achieve this level of perceptual performance is we call perceptual computing. So our, much, our human brain is able to do this very efficiently and at scale. Right. Now, um, <clears throat> the interesting thing is on the data side, we are creating data at unprecedented scale. In year 2008, we surpassed the capacity to store the data that is generated. So the, you know, we just simply don't, uh, we simply don't store a lot of data that is generated now. Remember the data growth is exponential. 
noise. Even in 2008, um, uh, just about half a percent of all the data generated were analyzed. The others may be monitored, and if somebody, a human, looked at the data, they may act upon it. But otherwise, that data is lost forever. And there are new modalities. Our brain is very good at processing all of the modalities. But the new modalities in computing and in physical systems where uh, we are generating more and more data. So text, which takes less amount of data to represent text, um, to images, to audio video files, genome sequencing, and now by 2020, maybe about 50 billion internet of things that will be constantly collecting the data and putting on internet. Internet of things means data, you know, these are devices that um, collect the data or, or have observations and then transform them into data and then they are put on the internet. That's why the internet of things, that's why there's internet there. So there are a lot of interesting questions um, that we have to ask. Of all the data generated, which data is relevant? And why? Which data we should analyze? Which data can offer the insights? Who cares for what data? How to get attention to a human decision maker? What we need is intelligent processing, processing to get actionable, or what I call smart data. That's a term that I used in 2004. Uh, I think it's increasingly relevant that, that you want to convert the data into something that makes sense to human decision making, for human to get insights, for human to act upon. So uh, the smart data is some, you know, I define that as um, harnessing value out of all the challenges of big data, volume, velocity, variety. So how do you solve problems with renewable complexity, gather vast amount of data, diverse knowledge, and come up with intelligent decisions in, in a timely manner. Right? That, that is the um, principle, that, 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 that's the philosophy behind smart data. Let me uh, describe uh, smart data with an example and also a kind of uh, allude to the kind of in, you know, intelligent processing that we would seek to have through better understanding, through better machine understanding of the data. So you have a sensor, a blood pressure meter, uh, you know, cuff and a blood pressure monitor. It will give you a value 150. That's data. By itself, it is meaningless. You start to get some meaning to the data by describing it as an information. Systolic blood pressure, you say it's a systolic blood pressure. You label the data, and that is information. Then you refer to the guideline uh, from NIH, National Institute of Health, let's say, that um, it is hypertension level 1 when your systolic blood pressure is above 140. So um, that would be called elevated blood pressure. And yet, elevated blood pressure is not sufficient for a clinician to give you medication to decide your treatment. He or she would have to decide whether it is the elevated blood pressure is because of um, hypertension or hypothyroidism. And that you might call this is DIKW, data information knowledge wisdom, or that you know at that top level is where you can make a decision. That's the kind of insight you need to make a decision. Right. So, um, in doing so, then I will use pedagogy. Pedagogy meaning to somewhat simplify the whole discussion because the complexity of all of this is something we still we learn. It's going to take a long time for us to learn what, what, how, how, how that intelligence, how human intelligence works. We continue to develop new knowledge about it, and then how we can make machines that can uh, emulate uh, human intelligence. I come down to two core things, and perhaps this is not, not very new. A lot of other researchers in the past have thought about these issues. One is that you are able to, you have your own endemic, you, are, you, are, you have your own knowledge and experiences. Right? So people who have more knowledge than others are able to take better or faster or different decisions. 
right? Hence, having the knowledge is important. So I would argue that you want to develop a, uh, you know, machine intelligence, that machine should have access to and be able to process the knowledge. Right? So if I were to then um, um, uh, uh, take a look at the most um, thought about, talked about um, aspect of artificial intelligence, which is machine learning, let's think what knowledge are we giving to the machine. The knowledge in most cases, the most used type of machine learning is supervised machine learning. And the knowledge that is given to machine is given indirectly or given in a limited way. The problem is set up as a classification level problem, binary or multi-level classification. And then you say, uh, somebody annotates the data, somebody labels the data, or a whole bunch of people label the data, or there is data is self-labeled, whatever way. But that labeling itself is, a, is an intellectual property, uh, you know, activity. So the labeler, the annotator, is using his or her own intellectual um, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a processes to decide the label. And different people probably can come up with different label. That's why then you talk about inter-annotator agreements. Right? All, that, that all, all that is happening in the human brains of the annotators is reduced to something much simpler, the end label. So you lost a lot of information out there. There's the lot of things that is there out there in human brains that is not really captured when you are doing a notation. And then you have trained your machine learning algorithm on those annotations, which is a partial information about the real world. Right? So I would argue that with that tech when you compare that approach to some other approach where the machine actually has more access to the knowledge that humans use in the first place to do that annotation, for example, would be smarter, would be more intelligent. Right? That is the importance of knowledge, which is what this talk is about really. And the other thing is reasoning, that given some baseline, some knowledge that you are able to think more, you are able to take the next step, you are able to make direction, you are able to make reasoning of various form. Right? So you can validate the hypothesis or get more information about an hypothesis to further in order to be able to validate that hypothesis. Right? So that is a reasoning technique or reasoning uh, you know, capability. So we can simplify, again this is a pedagogy, there are probably a lot of nuances that are left out, is that intelligence, to think about intelligence you need to think about both knowledge and experience and reasoning. I will posit that in these days in artificial intelligence not enough attention has been given on the knowledge side of it. So we, about the reasoning, there is another talk. Uh, which I will be giving at uh, the keynote that I will be giving at uh, Web Intelligence will deal with that part. And we had a paper that describes that to some extent semantic, cognitive, and perceptual computing that shapes human experience. We, call, we think about it as a three strand. There is a very well known book uh, about uh, the golden braid, uh, Escher, Bach, uh, what is he? Escher and, and Godel. And the eternal you know, uh, uh, braid. Uh, and this beautiful, you know, book that talks about three um, intertwined uh, aspects of, of, of arts and, 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 and in fact a lot more than arts actually. And it's been discussed in the context of computing in fact. Similarly, uh, we think uh, and we have, you know, in our pedagogy, we divided uh, the components of the reasoning types in semantic, cognitive and perceptual. So, I won't talk about that later, but there is uh, a, a video talk on uh, on YouTube or uh, that you can look it up. Today I will focus on this particular paper and the things that are in this paper and summarize that in this particular talk. So at uh, our center, Noisy Center, uh, a lot of activities we do uh, is centered around um, improving upon what 
people can do without knowledge by using the knowledge. So we look at improving upon machine learning and NLP and other techniques uh, and mining through better utilization of knowledge. <coughs> and uh, in particular, I would also uh, pay some attention to things that we don't pay enough attention to in computing, in that a lot of computing uh, has focused on using sing single modality, text computing, text computing, or, you know, text processing, image processing, video processing, and so on and so forth. But um, human brain processes all of these modalities simultaneously uh, extremely well, correlates all the data coming from different modality very well. And there again, knowledge plays an important role in connecting the dots coming from different modalities. And that without the knowledge, you would not have the right reference to be able to connect those dots well. Right? So, um, uh, talking about the uh, knowledge, um, my own um, experience in creating knowledge bases and um, using them goes back to 1991. And then uh, there's a keynote that I gave uh, in 1992, so far yet so near, so far schematically yet so near semantically, where I talked about use of ontologies and um, its role in um, heterogeneous data uh, integration and number of other things and semantic computation and uh, in determining how two objects are similar or different. That fundamental question of semantics is something uh, you know I explored in the context of use of ontologies. But one of the most uh, I think uh, important uh, milestone uh, came uh, after I started the company, uh, probably the first semantic web company in 1999. And uh, from that company we filed this patent. You can see the title of the patent, and that was awarded in 2001, where we created a knowledge base in diverse domains. You can see, you know, in sports, there are all these subdomains. So a variety of domains, uh, uh, you know, we took different domains and we created large knowledge base. I don't have time today to see, to discuss with you how we did that, but I will give you a pointer to uh, a, an article or a post that, that discusses that in more detail. And there are many papers on this topic. And then what we did is to use the knowledge to improve the search. That is why that was the first commercial semantic uh, search system that we developed. Searching, profiling, browsing, personalization, advertisement, all of those things. Right? So these are the kind of things that you typically do on the web. And we focused on use of the knowledge to improve all of those things. We did have machine learning, we did have classification and other things in these things. But the use of knowledge was what was particularly unique. So, um, uh, before I talk about the use of knowledge, I want to note that in recent years, we have created a number of large knowledge bases. So, this thing of, of using knowledge bases has become much easier lately. That we have developed ability to search or find the relevant knowledge base to apply. For a human brain, we have capacity to apply all the knowledge we have at all the times. Our brain is fantastic, is fantastic in being able to marshal just the part of the knowledge necessary to understand, to do a particular task. Right? Now, if you want to make computers intelligent, we need to do the same. That there is all that knowledge out there. One potential advantage um, in computational system is that you're no longer limited to knowledge of a single person. So you may create knowledge by involving many, many people and uh, recording their agreements. That's wonderful. And yet, when you're solving a problem, you have to apply that particular knowledge. For example, I may have, uh, I may be talking about a person, John Smith, but there are 100 John Smiths in my knowledge base. It would be very important to identify that particular John Smith and take the knowledge about that John Smith, like where he lives and what is his profession and so on and so forth, 
to be able to make intelligent process, you know, processing. So, being able to find the relevant knowledge and then extract a relevant subset, which then can be applied to solve the problem, whether it is search or anything else. And we also need to be able to uh, maintain this knowledge base, keep it enriched. As the new knowledge is continuously created, to be able to add that to the repertoire of knowledge that we, our computer algorithms are using, or reasoning systems are using, right? Um, with the previous slide that I showed, um, there is a link here, and that um, you know uh, discusses the um, role of knowledge graph uh, in many applications involving big data. So very briefly. Knowledge graphs have become prominent. You can see, for example, Link Open Data that has uh, nearly 10,000 data sets and nearly uh, or around 150 billion tables. These are facts. Your DBpedia, which is just one of them, which is the most used and popular one. You have um, industry consortia that have come up with something like schema.org, which is creating knowledge all the time about all those web pages on the web. You have proprietary knowledge bases like very very well known Google Knowledge Graph. In 2013, Google came up with its own knowledge graph. Fundamentally, or in principle, it is very similar to the knowledge graph that I showed you, um, you know, in the in the in the in this slide here. Similar to this, it's very similar. In principle, of course, um, after 13 or 15 years, uh, the process of creating that is somewhat different. But its, it's role in search, for example, is very similar. We also had in those days something called rich media reference uh, objects, similar to the you know uh, object that uh, Google shows uh, on the right when you do a search on some entity. Um, we have developed techniques. So um, I have uh, we, we we have uh, students um, at Noesis that uh, work on this type uh, this particular topic where. Uh, they show how they can uh, take this large linked open data and from that create subsets of them, say focus on books or movies, and then apply them, for example, for recommendation, for ranking, and so on and so forth. And uh, we have worked on um, ability to developing a, uh, techniques to process text, let's say. There's so much you know, data today in text, right? So in corporate or enterprise environment, uh, it is generally said that unstructured data is about 80% or more, structured data is just 10 to 20%, right? So with all that unstructured data that is available, let's say clinical notes in electronic medical records, how do you process that text? And create from that uh, pieces of knowledge, right? So, and for example, in this case, here we are showing that you have all these conditions, but you find an, a mention of edema that is new. So now you can ask questions, is this a knowledge that was previously not captured in my knowledge base? And if so, you can add it to a knowledge base. And this is a process of enriching a knowledge base. So knowledge plays indispensable role in deeper understanding of content. That's the core part of this talk. Especially interesting situations include large amount of situations where large amount of training data are unavailable. Right? So could knowledge step in? A relevant, can we have a relevant subset of knowledge that we can apply when we can't, you know, uh, put many people working busily to create large enough amount of training data or notations? Another example is objects to be recognized are complex. For example, implicit entities, which I'll give you an example of, or highly subjective content. In applications um, that um, need to use complementary or related data in multiple modalities of media. So in the multimodal context, again, um, 
these are some of the interesting situations. There are many, many situations. For the given time I have, I am focusing on these three situations in particular. So the examples or applications that I'll discuss are implicit entity recognition and linking, understanding and analyzing drug abuse related discussions on web forums, understanding city traffic dynamics using sensor and texture observations, and emoji similarity and sense distributions. In my group and in, in at Noisy Center, we almost always uh, look at real world situations, real world data, such that our research can have real world impact. So you can see some of these examples, uh, they come from very much real world situations at the real world scale. Let's look at implicit entity recognition and linking. Throughout my talk, there will be links to um, you know, some of the papers where you, that you can go to to get more details than what I'm, I'll be able to present today. So let, take a look at this example. This is a text in clinical notes. And uh, you have um, entities there, Dr. Davies or Bob Smith. You have some relationships. And you have entity linking, those, in, those things in the blue. But you have something very interesting. Here you see the text here comfortably breathing in room air or accumulation of fluid in his extremities. Now these kind of stuff are not specifically uh, described medical terms. So the medical term is edema, but different doctors would describe the conditions edema indirectly or implicitly. And hence it is very important to be able to recognize that this is actually an entity. So to our knowledge, uh, there hasn't been any other uh, work in this area. The reason for me to take this example here is that I want to emphasize that when you have such complex problem, compared to let's say understanding Dr. Davis or Bob Smith and what entity that represents, understanding which entity this represents is far difficult. So it's a more complex problem of recognizing an entity, an implicit entity in this case, what we, de what we define, what we call as an implicit entity. And uh, we uh, end that having a knowledge makes this problem more tractable, more doable. More it's more possible to solve this problem, to identify implicit entities by having um, entities. There are many other cases of complex uh, things, uh, you know, uh, recognitions in text. For example, uh, sarcasm and some uh, sentiments, uh, descriptive information, which is similar to um, implicit entity, which is implicit entity. Um, emphasize features of an entity, communicate common understanding, stylistic references, and so on and so forth. So there are all these different ways where um, you know complex texts come about and understanding the entities involved in this kind of text is particularly challenging. Let's, how big a problem this is? So in a corpus that we evaluated, 20% of movie references and 40% of um, book references in tweets were implicit. And that in clinical narratives, 35% of edema, concept of edema, and 40% of shortness of breath were described implicitly. Right? So, uh, if indeed that is the case, and you fail to recognize all those occurrences of entities, obviously you're missing out, missing out a lot. Right? So it's very important that you're able to identify these missing entities. Think about uh, people working on techniques to improve entity recognition or NER and achieve one, two, three, four percent improvement over the prior best method. All that is nothing compared to missing out on such large percentage of these increased entities which if recognized would really uh, get you far better information than is other possible. With 
both explicit and implicit entity, you will get the structured data that can then help with a whole bunch of applications. So for example, it can help you with computer assisted coding in uh, health informatics case or 30-day uh, readmission prediction again in health applications, clinical application context or sentiment analysis. So here is an example text here. You can see the patient showed accumulation of fluid in his extremities, but the patients were unlabored and there were no use of accessory muscles. Right? And the point here is that such a knowledge, so, so, such a text is, um, while I'm not going to into detail of exactly how we achieved this, what I would say is that understanding the entity involved here, which is the edema, uh, is impossible without clear description of what edema is and our ability to understand from whatever is described in the medical literature and medical knowledge basis. So I can consider, you know, you can, you can say that, well, edema is a term that is defined and I have access to this definition. Can I create techniques that will utilize this definition, learn from it, and then translate, you know, apply to this thing to understand that that is uh, a, a mention of edema, right? So basically, in the work that we did, um, we were able to improve compared to the standard techniques with the appropriate knowledge, we were able to get about 10% better overall, um, you know, uh, performance of entity recognition. Can it? Can this be more than that? Maybe, probably. I don't know yet. But whatever you get here is quite significant. Let's look at the second problem: understanding and analyzing drug abuse-related discussion on web forum. So. Um, uh, we've been uh, doing uh, very interesting research in the area of um, uh, prescription drug abuse and we would uh, analyze Twitter data, tweets, as well as we'll understand, we analyze web forum. So here what you see is a text from a web forum. I was sent home with 5x2mg suboxone. I also got a bunch of phenobarbital. I took all 180 milligram and I did not do shit exam, you know, all the stuff, right? So you can see that there's very informal text here. And um, there are a lot of kind of, a lot of things that you can recognize in the text. You can recognize entities. You can recognize dosage. For example, um, you know, the uh, two milligram, which is a dosage. Um, you can recognize pronouns. You can recognize interval after five minutes. You can recognize route of administration, um, route of administration, which is injected, injected yeah, right there. Uh, relationships, sentiment, like that. Right. So there are a lot of things that you can recognize from this text. To give you an intuitive idea of the importance of knowledge base. Let me point out that we, when we developed this drug abuse ontology and we looked at the corpus, we found that for every occurrence of term buprenorphine, which is a concept in the ontology, there were 33 um, slangs and uh, informal uh, and abbreviated occurrences of that concept. So bup, for example, for buprenorphine. Right? such a large number of variants. It is quite possible for humans to develop this ontology and capture once and for all a whole bunch of variants. So you can keep on, you know, you can keep on extending that as you come across new occurrences. But once you created, once you noted in your ontology, all of those Variants, it becomes possible for you to understand what is in the text. Think about using a machine learning technique 
purely without the knowledge base to understand all the variants of buprenorphine. You, you can say there will be too much noise or you can say that the number of, uh, you know, the data will be so sparse for each of the individual variants. Number of annotations available from, let's say, 10,000 that you decide to annotate would be so minuscule for each of the 30, uh, 30, 33 occurrences that you really would not get a good classifier. And hence, you really would not have good um, success in understanding any error. So this shows you very clearly how it is nearly impractical or impossible to uh, understand uh, you know, such informal text and identify all these variants without investing your time in creating knowledge base and using it in your approach. And then you can you know, have a whole variety of things. You can have ones where you can have direct concept match with the ontology. You can have lexical uh, things. For example, you might have emotion, intensity, pronoun, and sentiment bearing terms. You may have lexico-ontological things, drug form, route of administration, all that, where you are using both of those lexical and ontological things. And then you can have rule-based grammar to analyze certain things like uh, dosage. So you need a whole variety of techniques to do the NLP here. And that alternatives without use of um, knowledge uh, or the ontology here would be uh, quite um, you know poor. Let's look at the third example: understanding city traffic using sensors and textual observations. So this becomes interesting because now you are talking about multimodal data, right? And 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 there is relatively fewer amount of work in literature compared to processing one modality of data at a time. And so this, in that sense, this is. Um, a, a, a attractive case for us to look at and see what role knowledge plays in this particular kind of application. So this slide basically simply says that um, traffic problem is a very big problem and there are uh, uh, more than billion cars on the road today and they will double, nearly double by 2020. And there are a lot of questions that people ask when you try to do traffic management or traffic management application, traffic predictions, and so on and so forth. And these are relatively well known. And people try to solve that using uh, various techniques, including machine learning. The interesting thing here is that the problem becomes more solvable when you do two things. When you use multiple data sources, multiple types of data sources that give you complementary information on any things that occurs in the traffic, such as a traffic event. And when you use the knowledge to connect information and our knowledge coming from multiple sources of data, different modalities of data. So this problem is very challenging because uh, you start with non regularity in the traffic da in your data dynamics so first of all you know you would you know really say for example uh, information on speed uh, and you would have low speed because of an accident you would have low speed because of um, rush hour you would have low spe speed because of um, uh, some events large event uh, near that particular road network and such right? so there are these things happen a lot of these things are beyond your control some of them are known ahead of the time others are not so one of the things that you have to do here is to understand what is normal. To understand what is happening in the traffic, what is an e eventful aspect of the traffic. You understand what is not even non-eventful, what is in routine, what is normal. So in this particular case and without going into too much detail, here we created models of normalcy using a um, statistical uh, model linear dynamical system here for 7 by 120, uh, 7 by 24 time slots. So for each of the 7 days a week, 24 hours a week, we created the normalcy model for each of the links involved. 
in our um, example, we took data for a year from San Francisco area. So that's a very massive, you know, num amount of data, and this takes a lot of computational power. And um, then we started tagging anomalies that uh, you know start occurring. So wherever there were um, variations from the normal sea, we started to tag them, and. Um, once we had that, and so this kind of shows you like over a period of time, uh, different hours of the day, what is the normal data on different day, you know um, weeks of that uh, of that hour. There are some of these things that are normal explanations. I won't not very interesting. A complementary source of data was social data. So uh, we are able to um, classify um, social media data coming from a particular region, in this case San Francisco Bay region as an example, or any other region that you're interested in, into what kind of this, you know, uh, city departments would be interested in. Which city department would be interested in? So these are what you see here are variety of city related functions. So this was done in the context of the smart city project. So these are all transportation related events. And we can further divide, uh, you know, uh, look at location information and say these are transportation events from the area of our interest and so on and so forth. Now in this case, we were able to bring together, so first of all, we are, the knowledge played a variety of roles. One of the roles the knowledge play is to better understand the social data and do entity identification. In this tweet, for example, Half Moon Bay Brewing Company, it's a five gram, and understand, extracting such entities is pretty hard. And only some um, techniques, uh, some techniques work better than others for extracting uh, you know, and you know, four grams and five grams and such things. And um, CRF is one of them. But having the knowledge that says all the locations, o OSM is a knowledge base of uh, 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 of locations, open state map. Scribe ontology is an ontology for smart city or city related things. And phi 11org has um, knowledge related to specific to transportation domain. So we brought together or we, we, we leverage all these three different types of knowledge for a variety of things including starting with in creating in a better understanding, better extracting entities from the text and then find, we could find that for a particular incident, let's say road construction, we were able to find traffic related data from road network and match it up with complementary data from Twitter. That one piece of data, we started seeing slow traffic and then half an hour later people started complaining about fog and um, you know, they said why the traffic is slow in social media. So, um, uh, and here is the, one of the most interesting uh, slides. So here, we observe that traffic is very slow. Right? But the explanation for that is coming from the social media. So we are able to focus on the kind of incidences that are occurring, that are reported, we are able to uh, do spatial temporal filtering of the data. So what might be the tweets that are relevant to something happening at a particular location on the road? And through the 
So, so with that matching, we look for what could be, for example, events that lead to making traffic slow. All the remember we have this five point five eleven dot org hierarchy. So that kind of knowledge is coming from those hierarchies. We are not we don't have to learn it. It's given to us because we have uh, knowledge bases. Some of them are built by humans. So this kind of being able to connect and use the Twitter data as an explanation for road sensor data, these kind of things becomes far more possible because of the user knowledge. If you had to do solve this problem purely through let's say machine learning, I doubt that you could get anything close to this. So uh, what did we what do we see here? Just to summarize, this de example demonstrates use of multimodal data streams, types of events from text, signature from sensor data, signature in the sense slow moving traffic and such. It uses multiple sources of declarative knowledge or ontologies. We do we did semantic annotation and enrichment. We use rich representation using this probabilistic graph model, the linear dynamic system, and learn probabilistic model uh, uh, that improved, uh, in a, uh, the learning uh, of probabilistic model improved by use of declarative knowledge. Statistical approach were used to create the normalcy models and understand anomaly using historical data. And then we explain anomalies using expected events. So we use uh, declarative knowledge to approximate nonlinear models using a collection of linear dynamic systems. All that then led to providing actionable information. The actionable information is that there is an overturned uh, truck or some other accident that is the reason for this particular slowness in the thing. There can be a lot more things can be done. For example, we may observe 1,000 occurrences of accident of this particular type, let's say involving a truck, on a particular type of road, let's say two-lane two road, and then you, all, you know, analyze them over a period of time, and then figure out, so roughly, if this accident occurred at this time of the day, how long it might typically take for the traffic to get, to become normal. This kind of stuff then, again, you can do. But having this knowledge base makes this problem far more solvable. I hope you get a sense. Final question, final example is that of emoji similarity and sense disambiguation. Last year, or uh, 2016, uh, 6 billion emoji messages so with emojis were exchanged every day. There was 20% month over month growth of use of emoji in the context of marketing messages or 777% growth in one year and um, what we want to do is to automatically process and derive meaning and interpret text fused with the emoji so that we can understand the emoji. So what happens is increasingly people are using this mixed forms, text and emoji to convey what they want. An emoji is a rather rich representation, right? With one little emoji, you could be conveying an emotion, right? Uh, you may be conveying a feeling. You may be conveying an intention. That would take a lot of text. And the nuances with such wide variety of emojis available, 10 different types of or X number of laughs, with variety of laughs, sarcastic laugh, laugh, you know, uh, laugh and truly being happy. That is very rich. But because that is very rich, and in that sense it is a type of natural language, it is extremely complex. Right? That richness of number of emojis Maybe I should remember how many emojis there are. Sanjay, how many emojis there are? Around 2,600 now. Okay. So, you know, this number of emojis is around 2,600 now and growing. 
So to be able to understand that having access to knowledge base that capture emoji meaning can play very important role in representing, contextually disambiguating and converting emojis into text. Right? And this can uh, help uh, to leverage existing NLP techniques to process and better understand emojis. So uh, a group uh, developed uh, this thing called EmojiNet by leveraging uh, component pieces of knowledge from multiple sources. There is Unicode emoji list, there is Emojipedia, there is Emoji Dictionary and there is BubbleNet. And there is a nine tuple that was, that was created in EmojiNet that capture variety of different features or, or, or parameters describing an emoji. So this is a very comprehensive description of what emojis are, what they represent, what they mean, and so on and so forth. And the uh, emoji uh, sense investigation is the ability to identify meaning of an emoji in the message, in the context of the message, in a computational manner. So that's a very hard thing to do. And you know, you might have emoji like that, and the sense could be laugh, crying, crying with laugh, you know, so much laughing, so much that you're crying, it's hilarious. There are nuances of all these things, right? I can't stop laughing. My knee hurts, already in tears. Central intelligence was damn hilarious. Right? So there are three different meanings. Which meaning are you, you have when you use that emoji? That's a very, very challenging problem. Right. So, here is an example. Pray for my family. God gained an angel today. Next one. Hard to win, but we did it, man. And high five. So that's praying, high five. Let's celebrate. Right. And there are many different sense of praying and high five. And there are context works that are accepted from EmojiNet for each of those senses. And then, given two or more emojis, how do you calculate similarity between them? That's the challenge of emoji similarity. So, um, Now, I, I won't be able to go into, I won't be going into too much detail about this here. The point that we are trying to make here is that to be able to then do the task of finding the similarity or disambiguation, it would be extremely hard if you did not have a very comprehensive knowledge. Because you have all those nuances to be captured. You have all those variations to be captured. For the same representation, your different interpretation in different contexts. And if you do not have that knowledge base created, then your space of investigation is too broad your need for notations would be too large, your amount of data sets available for notation will simply not be there because the data will be relatively sparse. Some of the emojis are used very frequently and in multiple senses, other emojis are used much less frequently but in a fewer senses and do getting all of those things would be almost impossible. Okay, so in this particular case, in EmojiNet, to, using EmojiNet to measure similarity, we combine distributional semantics of words that are learned from word embeddings, and this comes from learning techniques, and emoji definitions in EmojiNet, that is actual knowledge, to model emoji embedding. So the point here is that you made the techniques more powerful by combining state-of-the-art learning techniques 
distribution, uh, distributional semantics here or word embedding or things of the nature, conceptual embedding with the knowledge basis. That makes for more powerful technique and uh, basically the result is that this emoji embeddings uh, model outperform the previous embedding models purely based on distribution semantics by about 10% per right now. I hope we can do even more than that, but that's something that we have right now. So let's summarize. In the emoji sense similarity and disambiguation, we use the knowledge uh, that is captured in EmojiNet, which itself was derived from multiple sources of knowledge. And we could solve the emoji interpretation problem far better, or significantly better, I would say. In implicit entity recognition, we adapted UMLS, Unified Medical Systems Definitions, for identifying medical entities, and Wikipedia and Twitter data for identifying Twitter entities. And this problem was not solved before. And we think that use of such knowledge made this problem solvable. That would have been hard or impossible to solve the problem otherwise. In understanding drug abuse related discussions, applications of we use uh, drug abuse ontology along with slang, slang term dictionaries and grammar and we could solve prob problem that was not solved well at all. In the traffic analysis we use statistical knowledge extraction and using ontology for Twitter event extraction and we use ontology for Twitter event extraction and we are able to correlate multimodal data stream and um, in addition, the thing that I didn't discuss though, but that we could provide explanation, that is virtually impossible. So very often, the machine learning, uh, you know, AI, many AI techniques, machine learning techniques in particular, are black box techniques. And that another very important um, reason for using knowledge base, which I did not discuss today, in detail, in detail today, is to possibly make them gray label or white label techniques, such that we can provide the explanation as I was as in the example of um, saying overturned truck as a reason for traffic slowdown. That is an example uh, where you can provide the explanation. If you had pure machine learning, that would have been very hard because your models would not have been trained for all the possible types of events. In 511.org, uh, I would have represented all the uh, types of uh, traffic events that are of interest to humans. But in a typical machine learning technique, uh, you probably li limit yourself to adverse event on traffic and such rather than having all those things categorized further at the level. So the takeaway is data alone is not here enough. I'd seen this title in uh, Pedro Dominguez's uh, 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 article uh, summarizing machine learning related challenges. And what we what I advocate here is to combine data centric or bottom up or statistical learning with knowledge based top down techniques, combining top down and bottom up techniques to improve understanding of simpler content, to understand complex content and concepts, and to understand heterogeneous multimodal context content. And uh, you know, some of my colleagues and uh, of that paper that I mentioned, a group is uh, pretty large. Uh, um, with about uh, 25 or so researchers um, and in Noesis about um, uh, 45 to 60 researchers and 15 faculty. Yeah, questions?